Hi, I'd like to call the meeting to order. This is a meeting of the Auburn School Committee, January 6th, 2021. Um, we'll just sort of go around the table and, and, and take an attendance so folks at home know who they're watching and just in case any of the cameras are not working. So we have uh, <laughs> Dr. Hanfield here tonight, George Scobie, Dr. Chamberlain, <clears throat> Dr. McCrillis, Dorothy Kaufman, Jesse Harrington, Jasmine Gates, Cecilia Worsbicki, and Elaine Zotner. Do we have anyone else joining us this evening? All right, any citizens to comment? If no one else is joining, I'm guessing there are no citizens comments. Nope. That being said, we'll move right on to special recognitions. Dr. Hanfield. Great, thank you, Mr. Chair, and good evening, everyone. Happy New Year. It's nice to be back with you. Um, we have a couple of special recognitions this evening. Um, first, a sad uh, special recognition. Uh, Donald E. Johnson, 89, of Auburn, passed away on Wednesday, December 9th, 2020, at the Life Care Center of Auburn following a period of declining health. Don served for many years as the head custodian at the Julia Bancroft School. He leaves his wife of 67 years, Ruth, his daughter, Catherine Brunel, and her husband and a grandson, Timothy Brunel. So if we could just take a quick moment of silence and recognition of Mr. Johnson's passing. Thank you. Secondly, under special recognitions tonight, uh, Mr. Davis recently informed me that the um, Facebook community helped to raise over $600 through a post by high school um, Unified Basketball Coach Nicole Lee Provost uh, on the Town of Auburn's Facebook page. Community members used Donors Choose to support the Unified Athletic Program, and this money will help pay for rubber basketballs and sport dots and other things that they can use to run some of their Unified season virtually. Ms. Lee Provost reported that um, we are so thankful to all of the donors, and on behalf of the Uni Unified Athletes, I'd like to thank the uh, Facebook community too. That was a terrific thing that they did. And um, I'd like to also commend Ms. Lee Provost for finding a creative way to engage um, some of our most special students uh, during this period of, um, you know, of COVID where things are difficult to be doing in person. So um, it's really awesome, really awesome. Absolutely, any comments? No, well, just thank you very much for that. <clears throat> and now we'll move on to the student representatives report. Jasmine, would you like to take over? Um, thank you. Things are still going well, I feel like, but I do think that it's getting more difficult from a student's perspective. Um, finding motivation, I feel like, to get up and go to class and stay on class the entire time and then when we're in school, come home and take our final class. So it's definitely um, not ideal, which everyone is aware of, but I think everyone's trying to do their part to make it as enjoyable as possible. I know that our teachers have been really understanding um, with students turning in work and if they don't get something done, you know, trying to offer them a little bit of leeway with when they turn it in and, but like they're still maintaining a good form, I guess. Um, so I think there's definitely that. Um, I think everyone's still like just tired of what's going on, but I mean, what other option do we have? But things are still looking good, you know? I think everyone is still coming to class, which is good. I know at the end of last year, attendance, I feel like, was starting to get rough, like some kids weren't coming. But in all my classes, we've been having perfect attendance, which is really good to see. So overall, I think things are still going well. I think it's just motivational at this point and students really pushing themselves to stick with it. Jasmine, that makes total sense. Um, I'm seeing that at my school as well. And, and students actually feel guilty that they're not getting the work done, but for some reason they just can't find, find that motivation. I think once we, once we shift gears and, and, and get back into the building again, and um, hopefully get on to, you know, a fa the phase where we can have everyone back in the building. I think every I think everyone will um, 
wake up again, there'll be that sense of excitement um, that we used to see in schools. And but it's totally understandable. Tell your your classmates that they're you know that they're not alone. Everyone's feeling this, as you said, including including the teachers. This is difficult for us. It's difficult um, for us seeing our students that we're used to seeing perform at a high level, um, not not be motivated the way that they usually are. So it's sad all the way around, but there's definitely a light at the end of the tunnel. And um, we appreciate the work that you guys are doing. Thank you. There is one other thing that I just remembered um, and it's in regards to um, our iPads. I don't know if this is necessarily like the place to speak about this, but um, recently I think that, I think there was a new filter put on our iPads for um, pictures, I think, but I've heard several different complaints about it because when you look up a photo that's not even necessarily like a bad photo, even for just school projects, no photos are coming up in regards to the topic anymore and when we need them for school assignments. And even if you look up like cartoons or clip art of something like for any class, there's no relevant photos coming up anymore because I think that they're blocked. So that's been a complaint that I've heard. I don't know if there's something that can be changed for that, but I just know that it's been very difficult to find images in relation to what we're talking about in class for different assignments, because I think that they've been blocked, but even ones that aren't bad or anything like that, they're still not coming up. Jasmine, is that is that recent within the last few weeks? I think it's been within like that there like the last month I think. I think okay yeah you know it's 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 possible and, and dr chamberlain and i will absolutely look into that tomorrow and I, I thank you for bringing it to our attention um we had a similar issue in the spring if you you might remember this when we had a hard time accessing youtube for certain things and it had to do with some filtration settings that that we had um we had upgraded our filtration um firewall uh, uh software um, for our iPads and it kind of filtered out some of the things we didn't necessarily want to filter out. Um, so we will absolutely look into that um, tomorrow and uh, and get that fixed and, and um, so that doesn't happen moving forward. But okay, um, thank you but, so much. Yeah, no, and I again, I appreciate you bringing it forward because, um, you know, if we don't hear it from you, then we don't know. Um, okay. and, and, and then just to double back to your other comment, we, uh, we I so appreciate you know, the motivation piece. Um, and and I, I so appreciate how hard all of you are working in the schools. Um, trust me, it is, it is, I, I can speak personally how difficult it is. Um, and I'm sure Dr. Chamberlain can attest as well, but how difficult it is even for the adults, you know, to, to get up and keep moving forward um, in, in a situation that's very isolating, right? We're human creatures and uh, we need interaction and we need to be able to see each other and, and, and have that and um, it's a struggle even for the adults. So, you know, I applaud, you know, everyone for, for, for plugging through it. And, um, you know, we have every intention of, of resuming school in the hybrid way on Monday. Um, and hopefully that'll help a little bit. Bye. Um, Bye. So, but anyway, thank you for those comments and we'll, we'll get, take care of that tomorrow. Of course, thank you. Thank you, Jasmine. Did you happen to know, is Aaron at TJ Maxx tonight or? I just I'm not sure, but I did just shoot him a text right before okay. the just checking to see if he was coming, but there hasn't been a response, so yeah. he might be working. I'm not sure. Might be on hangar detail. Okay. Well, if he comes in, we'll 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 you know we'll just um, you know we'll just slide him in if he if he happens to come in. I we appreciate the fact that he's that he's trying to probably do something on a break. So anyway, thank you. Any comments for Jasmine? <clears throat> Justin, thank you so much for bringing everything forward. Um, I, I love hearing from the high schoolers about how it's going because we don't know if we don't hear. So thank you. Of and course, good luck. no problem. <laughs> thank you. Any other comments? <clears throat> thank you for that report. I think it was great. <laughs> yep, excellent as always. And if, if you have things to do, um, your excuse to go ahead and, and do them. I know you're probably excited to get back to your homework and we'll <laughs> catch up with you next time. Okay, thank you so much. Have a great night. Hi, Jasmine. Thank you. As well. 
All right, that was nice. I would now entertain a motion to accept the minutes of 11 24 20 and 12 9 20. I'll make that motion. Do I have a second? I'll second it. Roll call vote. Ms. Kaufman? Yes. Ms. Harrington? Yes. Ms. Holloway? Yes. Dr. McCrillis? And Mr. Scobie, yes. It is unanimous. And now we move on to the superintendent's report. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and again, good evening, everyone. I um, wanted to start off first by um, providing a COVID update. Um, as you are aware, uh, after Thanksgiving, we had a significant rise um, in COVID positive in quarantine faculty, staff, and students, uh, placing a strain on our ability to keep buildings open and remote programs going. Um, so myself and Dr. Chamberlain um, were in buildings assisting with coverage, and it just got to a point where it, it just didn't make sense um, we were hoping to get to the holiday break, um, but we didn't quite get there. Um, even with removing our remote period up to December 20th, um, we had to close two schools on, on December the 18th. So over the, uh, the holiday, uh, we have been reviewing zip slip data and especially been looking at it this week. Um, and we do have every intention of returning to our hybrid instruction um, coming on Monday. And the same three considerations um, will be um, in effect in terms of you know having schools open or not. Um, first and foremost, you know making sure that we have the faculty and staff to open schools safely. Um, should we have an event um, that we cannot adequately trace uh, for whatever reason, or if there's some catastrophic event that happens that's out of our control, um, those are really the only three things that we see um, you know that that would pro, uh, prohibit us from from being in school as scheduled. Um, the, the data this week, um, as I've notified the school community, um, as well as, as the committee, um, is, you know, we did have a big bump on Monday. We had 20. Um, it was five at the high school, five at the middle school, five at Swanson Road, three at PAC, and two at Bryn Mawr. Those numbers are, were alarming, uh, not unexpected. Um, if you recall, at Thanksgiving, after a three and a half day break, we had um, 10 to report coming off of that, that time period. Um, so we had 20 uh, to report coming off of about two weeks. And um, yesterday we had zero, um, and then today we had three, uh, two at Packachog and one at Little Rockets Preschool. So we're trending in the right direction, um, and we're hoping then that that continues. Um, in addition, um, over the break, as I also had notified, notified you and posted on, on Facebook, I'm gonna try and share my screen here with you. Um, can you see that? Yes. Okay, thank you, Gil. Um, so this is obviously our Barbon Public Schools website. Um, first and foremost, um, I've condensed all news announcements and COVID-19 information into one section. Um, this is our dashboard right here. Um, and our reopening guide, we moved right next to it. But down here, we embedded our, our Facebook site so it's easier for people uh, to see um, rather than have to go between um, the district website and then the Facebook site, uh, we embedded it right in. So um, all of that really is just um, side commentary. The real reason why I pulled the screen up was that I wanted to show you that um, we, we have posted this um, on our Facebook site. That is what the Atmos Air unit looks like. Um, it's about the size of a bread box. Uh, it's two dials, they both go to the right, and obviously the blue light means it's on, there's a little button in the back, and um, away it goes. And then I attached here um, all of the, the literature that talks about what the atmosphere unit does and um, how, it, uh, how it works to you know, purify already existing air. So we're excited for that, those are, those are up in classrooms now. Um, and we hope that, um, you know, people take another measure of comfort in knowing that, um, you know, they, we, we were talking about bringing those units in back in July. Um, we were talking about bringing them in right around this time. Actually, we were expecting them to be a little bit earlier, but as we had told you in previous meetings, um, you know, COVID issues around the country precluded um, earlier delivery. Um, but the reason why we got these units was to be another layer of, of security and comfort um, for our faculty, staff, and students. 
you know, around, um, you know, around COVID. The nice part about these units too, as we've talked about in the past, is that um, they will assist with um, um, catching and, and killing um, many respiratory illnesses, um, not just COVID, uh, not just the flu. Um, and that's discussed in the literature that, that we posted on the website. But, um, you know, we were very pleased that they came in. And, and as I say in the post here, um, I can't thank, you know, Joe Fahey enough, our director of facilities. I can't thank Cecilia enough, um, our business manager for working on, you know, the procurement part of this. I can't thank the town enough for working with us, um, you know, on this. This was um, a fairly large uh, endeavor that we embarked on. Um, we purchased 275 of these units to get them into schools and classrooms. Um, the town also, after seeing um, what we were doing, got in on it on the deal as well. And so they've purchased um, a number of units for their town buildings. And so um, we're just very pleased that we were able to do this and, and, um, and hopefully families, um, the faculty and staff um, and our kids, you know, again, will take another measure of comfort knowing that we're doing absolutely everything that we can to keep everybody as safe as humanly possible. Um, now, this doesn't take the place of our current existing strategies of hand washing, masking, social distancing. Um, those will all still be in full effect. But again, you know, this is just another layer of, of comfort um, and safety that, that um, we're happy to bring uh, to our kids and families. So, um, so we'll go from there. So we'll, you know, our numbers are trending in the right direction at, at you know, Wednesday of midweek. Um, and we'll see how they go. But, um, you know, this, this month, we've got five weeks uh, running up to February vacation. And so, we're, you know, we're optimistic that we can, you know, get through these five weeks uh, relatively unscathed. Um, and then, you know, get to that February break. And then, fingers crossed that it's downhill from there in terms of just things increasingly getting better and better. Um, and, and normalcy really starts to, to look like it can return. So, um, so that's that on COVID. If I may, George, from what I read, that's the Cadillac of air filters. We really it's, did buy the top of the line. Yeah. It really sounds like it's going to work great for us. Yeah, um, and I, I just, I haven't had a chance to find it, but I, I was watching, um, um, and, and I, I forget the doctor's name, I apologize, um, but I, I, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education has partnered with um, the TH Chan of School of Public Health through Harvard. They've really kind of been kind of our go-to um, in terms of collaborating about different things. And um, they were, um, one of the, the leads was on, one of the leads was on um, Channel 5 last night um, talking about, you know, air and air quality, especially now that we're in the winter months. And, and you know, he's, he mentioned three things. He mentioned the importance of, you know, keeping your windows cracked a little bit if possible, um, you know, having... Um, you know, adequate air circulation and filtration. And then the last piece, the third piece, which he said wasn't necess necessary, but a good idea was to bring in an air filter. Um, and to your point, um, yeah, I mean, this is what Dr. Chamberlain, myself, uh, Joe Fahey, um, you know, this is what we were doing, you know, back in the summertime was looking at, you know, what, what would these things be um, and, and what would be the best that we could, we could get to Auburn. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, they are the Cadillac. Um, and, and like I said, we're very, very fortunate that uh, we were able to work with the town on getting this done. Um, and so but we'll see. We're, like I said, we're, we're happy that it's, that it's in place. So hey, thank you. For that. Can anybody hear me? Yes. Okay. I get, my screen has gotten totally black, so I can't see what people are doing. I'm not sure what's going on with my um, screen, but, um, I guess my only question about this has to do with the letter that Julie Jacobson, our town manager, sent out on Monday talking about how much worse things are in Auburn than they are in the rest of the state. Yeah. I guess I'd just like to kind of hear what our Department of Public Health has to say about that if we're additionally concerned. I think it's wonderful that we have these additional filters in place, but uh, it seems like, you know, other communities that are much lower are even doing things like preemptive testing. Uh, for example, Salem was in the Boston Globe today stating that um, even though they are considered high risk, they're, they're lower than us, but they are um, doing spit testing to get kids back in school. So I, I'd just be interested to hear what our Department of Public Health has to say based on Julie's letter that came out a couple days ago. Sure. Beth, do you want to address that or?
Yeah, so, you know, I didn't speak, I, I had planned to speak with Darlene um, at the Board of Health tomorrow, um, but in our conversations prior to the break, and even then our numbers were escalating, um, you know, they, they, they're not positioned to tell us yes to open or to stay closed. What they are in a position to do is telling us, are we doing the right thing for having kids in school? And thus far, all of their communications with us have been in full support. Um, they have been very pleased with what's happened in schools and agree that transmission is not happening in schools. Now, that being said, you know, they, they fully are taking the brunt and understanding of the fact that numbers are escalating in, in, in uh, the Auburn community. Um, but all communications to us have been that they've just been really pleased with how we've managed all of this. Um, I have not spoken to them since to let them know that the Atmos Air units are in, so I have not communicated that to them at this point. Um, but we've not gotten any indications from them that, to my knowledge, feeling that um, there would be any reason for us to not have kids come back into the building. Okay, um, I, th I think I would personally feel better if we could, um, or even if there's just a communication that goes out to the committee at some point, you know, in the next couple of days to let us know exactly what they say. And again, this is only predicated on the urgency that was in Julie's letter to the town on Monday saying, you know, how much worse off we are even than Boston um, and how serious we need to take this, which seems like it's a different tone than what we've even heard from the town. Obviously, we need to, they've always said, you know, take this seriously. We're trying to stop this, this spread, but this had a sense of urgency to it. And um, you know, we want to keep our, our buildings open, obviously, as much as possible. But I, I think it seems like it was a it was a tone of alarm that I, I had not noticed before. So I, I would personally would feel more comfortable with that. Well, and through the chair, I, 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 I you know I agree. I think we're we're all you know in the same boat on that. In, in a meeting with with you know superintendents uh, just yesterday, you know we're all in the same boat. I mean, you look at two thirds of Massachusetts, central line east, and most of us are red communities and, and our, our rates are up in nine, 10%. Um, I think the narrative though, and from Julie's standpoint as a town, and then the narrative then focuses to, you know, what's what's the spread or, or what, what are the numbers within the school district? And that's what, that's what many school districts are focusing on. I mean, at, to Beth's point, the, the Board of Health, and I'm actually gonna mention it later in, this, in, in, in the meeting tonight, um, the Board of Health is not going to tell us whether or not we should be opened or closed or, or they, that was that became very clear in the winter sports debate. Um, right. and, and, and they have never, um, it's never been their position and, and Darlene Coyle will be very upfront as she reiterated a number of times in the winter sports conversation. Um, you know, they're not going to tell us, you know, whether or not we should be open or we should be closed. What they're going to tell us is exactly what Beth just said that we're doing all of the right things. Um, I, I don't know if, if the letter is the proper way to do that. I think um, perhaps, and it's up to the committee, I guess, uh, you know, if Darlene would write that, fine. But, you know, if, if you want to hear from Darlene at, a, at, a, at our next meeting, we could invite her to come. Um, you know, she's, she's always been willing to come and speak to the committee, um, you know, uh, when, when requested. So, um, you know, but I, I, yeah, I get it. I, I, I get it. I, I get it. Um, and Julie's, and Julie's no, yeah, it did have a sense of urgency to it. Of course it did. Um, but I think that there, therein lies, therein lies, I think some of the, um, you know, in, in every community, it, this is the discussion Well, the town is that the town is this and, and, you know, what does that, you know, mean for the schools and, and, um, you know, from Desi's standpoint, cause we were going through this with the teachers union yesterday, from Desi's standpoint, even if you are a red community, um, Desi still expects schools to be in hybrid and they still expect cohort D students to be in full time. If in fact there is an issue or a suspected case of school spread, then um, the room or building affected or buildings would be closed, would be cleaned, and then the expectation would be after appropriate tracing and all of that was done was that those schools reopen. Shrewsbury, as an example, um, had a case of a, a very strong suspected case of school spread um, right before the holiday in their preschool. And um, they uh, spoke with the state and, and don't forget the state has the rapid response testing team still at the ready. Um, 
so Superintendent Joseph Sawyer and Shrewsbury, uh, you know, reached out to the state. They sent their their rapid response, um, you know, uh, team to uh, to Shrewsbury, and and you know, fortunately, it was contained. There were no no other you know positive cases, um, you know. So that that's at our disposal too. But um, you know, I mean, Beth, I guess we we'll, we can follow up tomorrow with with Darlene and see see what she wants to do or. Yeah, I have to speak with her. Like I said, I have um, a plan to speak with her tomorrow anyway, and we have a standing Friday meeting. Yeah. Uh, so I can certainly speak with her. Thank you. Yeah, and I don't Thank think you. this is something that we will be able to find out, but I mean, I know we have two fairly large um, elderly communities in the, you know, between Life Care Center of Auburn um, and the assisted living. Um, so I wonder and I, I know I can't, haven't been able to find that data, but how many of the, are, are our numbers getting bumped up due to that? Because I know that in the spring, there was um, something that came out that our numbers were high. And then um, the next day we found out that there was a spike at one of the nursing homes. So I don't know if that's the case now, but I don't know if that's something we can find out. Yeah. yeah and that should be public, Mike. I think that came out in the, um, I believe that comes out in the, weekly public health report. If you go to the raw data, I could be wrong, but I think that I've looked that up before. And we're going to have another public health, or sorry, another weekly community report tomorrow as well. So, you know, it might all be a wash. I just, it, it gave me a moment of pause to see her, send, to see Julie send out a letter of community that, uh, sorry, a, um, a letter to the community that was so strongly worded um, given that we're coming fresh off of this. I just want to make sure that we're crossing our T's and dotting our I's. Right. Yep. Nope. That's no problem. Um, we we will do that. No problem. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay. Moving on. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm pleased to announce that we have um, a, a grant from Walmart um, received um, through the work of uh, Sarah Lemovitz, one of our school nurses. Um, once again, wrote another grant to support student health and nursing offices in the Auburn Public Schools through the Walmart Community Grants Team. Her grant has been approved and she will receive a check in the amount of $2,000. Uh, we'd like to thank Sarah for going above and beyond um, and it is our recommendation that we accept this uh, award with gratitude. I want to entertain that motion. I'll make a motion that we accept the award from Walmart with gratitude and much appreciation. Do I have a second? Second. Any discussion on that? Uh, what school is she a nurse at? The preschool. So, oh, the yeah. preschool. Oh, great. Yeah. So I was a yeah in the preschool. Yep. Yeah. So no, she um yeah she wrote this. I want to say um what she wrote back in the summer, right? I think late summer, early fall. Um yeah, and uh, and and was notified in late November. So um yeah, so thrilled that uh, that that we have that. So thank you very much. Um, we also um, uh, received a donation to food services very graciously. Uh, Mrs. King, um, Janice King, has notified me that uh, Ms. Donna Bacon uh, has once again donated $50 to the food service gift account, uh, which is earmarked for funding students' lunch debt. Uh, a big thank you letter is included in uh, your packets, and it's my recommendation that you approve this donation with gratitude for um, Donna's continued generosity. All right, I'm just gonna go back and finish up that, that other vote. And before I before I take the vote, just um, thanks a lot to, to Sarah for being. So oh, dead. I apologize. No, I threw okay. you off your game. Even, I mean, even even to work on things like that over the summer just shows how dedicated she is to her job and, and, and to our children. So Sarah, thank you for that. And um, are there any other comments? Um, roll call vote. All in favor, um, Ms. Kaufman? Yes. Ms. Harrington? Yes. Ms. Holloway? Yes. Dr. McCrillis? Yes. And Mr. Scobie, yes. It is anonymous, anonymous. It is unanimous and it is a vote. Thank you. It's not anonymous. We're not trying to hide anything. It's all about <laughs> transparency here. And now I would entertain um, that second motion I'll make a motion to accept with gratitude the $50 donation from Donna Bacon for the lunch service accounts or food service gift account. 
Do I have a second? Second. Any discussion on that? I would just like to add, I think this is the fourth time she's don donated money like this. Yes, uh, through the chair. You're correct, Gail. I, um, I, um, yeah, I, it, was a, it was a name that I, I thought sounded familiar. Um, uh, and so I, I, I spoke with, um, I, I asked ladies in the front office. And uh, yes, this is, um, this is, I believe, the fourth time that she's donated money to assist students with, uh, with lunch debt. So um, very, very gracious and very thoughtful. It is, and especially since she doesn't have any children of her own. To be thinking of other people's children is extra nice. Correct. I, I couldn't agree more, Gail. Any other discussion? Roll call vote. Mrs. Kaufman? Yes. Mrs. Harrington? Yes. Mrs. Holloway? Yes. Dr. McCrillis? Yes. And Mr. Scobie, yes. It is unanimous. Thank you. Thank moving you, Mr. On. Chair. Yes, moving on, it's, uh, we have a string of donations. Um, this next donation is the donation of an augmented reality sandbox. Um, the Roofley family, on behalf of Cisco Systems, uh, and due to corporate downsizing, has donated an augmented reality sandbox, which will be um, initially, initially housed at Auburn Middle School. Um, an augmented reality sandbox um, came about as the result of a uh, National Science Foundation funded project on informal science education for freshwater lake and watershed science developed by the UC Davis WM Keck Center for Active Vis Visualization in Earth Sciences. Um, together with the UC Davis Tahoe Environmental Research Center, Warren Hall of Science, and Echo Lake Aquarium uh, and Science Center. The project combines three visual visualization applications with a hands-on sandbox exhibit to teach earth science concepts. Augmented reality sandbox allows users to create topography models by shaping real sand, which is then augmented in real time by an elevation color map, topographic contour lines, and simulated water. The system teaches geographic geologic and hydrologic concepts such as how to read a topography map, the meaning of contour lines, watersheds, catchment areas, levees, etc. Um, before we, um, or before you, you take a motion to accept that, I'd like to share my screen again uh, with you. And for people that are watching at home, I'd like to just play this video about what an augmented reality sandbox is. Um, this is cutting edge technology that is starting to bridge its way into the educational world. And so for people not familiar with it, here's a little, a little clip. Well, that's a quick little uh, little look into what an augmented reality sandbox is. 
uh, it's, it's the, the best of uh, active learning, um, hands-on learning, um, meeting technology. And so we, we're very thankful um, for the donation and we look very much uh, forward to, um, to unpacking it, getting it set up. Uh, we do have it in district. We just have, an, we have, uh, just have to have an opportunity just to set it up um, and get, get it going. But it'll be um, a tremendous uh, resource for our children. Please, if I could, just if you know, if you've ever been to the Mystic Aquarium, that's the only they, they have one there, um, and there are very few school districts that are fortunate enough to have one. So it's really going to be a great add to our curriculum. I'd like to thank the Roofley family. Thank you for those comments. <clears throat> I would entertain a motion to accept. I'll make a motion to accept the augmented sandbox, augmented reality sandbox. Do I have a second? Second. Any discussion? I have a question. Is it a real sandbox and then you use the high tech glasses or? Yeah, so it's a real sandbox and then what, got, what, you, what you didn't see in the video is above it is the projector that brings the 3D into it. So it projects down onto the sand and does all of those things that you saw in that clip. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty cool. And, and Dr. Chamberlain's right. I, I, I did forget about that. Mystic Aquarium is, is probably the only one in the area that has something like that. Um, and yeah, I mean, we're, we're very fortunate and very excited. So we, we thank the Roofley family again. Um, um, we're actually looking forward as adults to playing with it first. So, uh, <laughs> if you notice when they held their hands over, like you could just see the shadow of their hands. That simulates the rain that comes down the mountains to make, yeah, it's amazing. Okay. Well, maybe when COVID is over, we can take a tour and see it. <laughs> Good idea. Okay. There, it's going to the same school as the therapy dog, so we could make it like a <laughs> joint visit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's going to, I think, I mean, and we'll, we'll flesh this out a little bit more, um, you know, once we, once we get it set up, um, just to figure out, you know, where the, where the best place is for it from a curriculum standpoint. I have a, I have a, a sneaking suspicion that it'll be housed primarily at um, the middle school, but it's also portable enough to where there would be real utility um, for it in, in our, our younger buildings, and even maybe some of our older buildings too, so, um, so we'll see. But um, it's a wonderful, wonderful teaching tool um, that uh, helps bring some some things to life that sometimes aren't always super exciting. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so to be able to to manipulate it and, and you know do the you know the hands on aspect of it is is really exciting. So. And to play with a sandbox once again and have yeah. a real excuse this time. <laughs> yes. Yes, indeed. Yeah. That's pretty awesome. Any other comments? Did I get a second on that? I did. Okay, as long as Elaine's got it. Okay, roll call vote. Ms. Kaufman? Yes. Mrs. Harrington? Yes. Mrs. Holloway? Yes. Dr. McCrellis? And Mr. Scobie, yes. It is a vote. Thank you so much. And moving on. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as, as is the case every year um, in, in quarterly, um, the Southern Worcester County Educational Collaborative, of which, of which we are a member, um, uh, has provided us, and I present to you this evening, um, their fiscal year 2020 annual report, as well as their fiscal year 2020 um, approved financial statements, um, as well as their FY21 first quarter report for the period of July 1 through October 1 of 2020. Uh, these documents do not need a vote to approve, but as a member district, it is required that they be shared with you and accepted by you. Okay. I would entertain that motion. I'll make the motion to accept the SWCEC's FY20 annual report, the FY2020 approved financial statements, and the FY21 first quarter report. Do I have a second? Second. Any discussion? 
Seeing none, roll call vote. Mrs. Kaufman? Yes. Mrs. Harrington? Yes. Mrs. Holloway? Yes. Dr. McCrillis? And Mr. Scobie, yes. It is a vote. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as I as I mentioned earlier, um, when we we're discussing uh, having the Board of Health comment on um, current COVID climate in, in town, um, I wanted to um, just make a, a clarification um, publicly here regarding the Board of Health's role with the Arm Public Schools. Um, and as I just referenced earlier, um, this this came to the fore. Um, well, it's come to the fore a few times, most recently around the winter sports discussion. At the beginning of December. Uh, Barbara High School principal, Mr. DeLongchamp, notified the high school community that athletics uh, for the winter season um, regretfully had been canceled. Uh, in his notice to the AHS community, he stated, and I quote, regretfully, we must inform you that we will not be participating in a winter sports season, basketball and hockey this school year. After many discussions and meetings with our school committee, Dr. Hanfield and our board of health, it was apparent that there are too many risks for participation. Uh, over the vacation and speaking with uh, town administration, it was brought to my attention uh, that the chairman of the Board of Health took exception to this statement as it implied from his perspective that the Board of Health um, uh, weighed in on whether or not we should have winter athletics. Um, and I'd just like to clarify that, that in fact, that he's right. The Board of Health did not weigh in. Um, they were consulted. But from what we do here in the public school side of things is we um, uh, consult and seek advice um, from the town director of health inspectional services director, uh, Darlene Coyle. Um, and her office has and, and continues to remain neutral um, in any and all school related matters. But what she really seeks to do um, is to work with us to see if um, uh, something can be done safely um, in current conditions. And so, um, I, you know, I apologize um, for the misunderstanding uh, that this may have caused in the community. Um, when we think of Board of Health in the schools, we're thinking of, of Darlene um, and, her, uh, and her assistant Eileen. Um, but there is a, a three-person Board of Health. Um, and uh, I, again, uh, apologize to the chairman um, and, and any others um, who took offense um, in, in thinking that we were uh, misrepresenting um, you know, the decision on the winter sports. As I've said a number of times publicly and on video uh, messages, you know, that was a decision that I made after consultation and, you know, contemplation. Um, and we discussed at length as a committee December the 9th. So I just wanted to go on record publicly and state that, um, you know, the Board of Health um, constituted of, of the three person body that it is in town did not uh, weigh in on this issue. Um, but rather the town director was consulted about it, but again, uh, took no position. So I just wanted to make that clear and, um, and hopefully that, that uh, clears up any misunderstandings, but also clears up, um, you know, what the, ro the role of the Board of Health is in the Auburn Public Schools. We've had a wonderful relationship with, with the Office um, of, of, of Public Health and Inspectional Services. We've worked with, uh, with them on a number of, of events, graduation, return to school, fall athletics, um, flu clinics, so on and so forth. Um, so um, that in our minds, that's Board of Health, um, but technically the Board of Health is the three member body. So I just wanted to, to make that uh, uh, expressly clear this evening. Um, and again, apologize for any misunderstanding um, out there uh, if there is any in the community. So thank you. I appreciate you clearing, clearing that up, Dr. Hanfield. And um, we, as, as always, we try to work closely and collaboratively with, with all boards, all committees. That's just been my experience over, over the last nine years. Um, so certainly we, we, don't go, um, we don't go looking for support, but rather we collaborate and, and try to build consensus. So I don't think it was ever a case where as a committee or as a school administration, um, we were looking for anyone's support. Um, you, you made some decisions along with your staff, your admin team. Um, we totally supported it. And uh, it's unfortunate, unfortunate that, um, that they may have been mistaken about, you know, what we were actually um, trying to accomplish. What we weren't trying to accomplish is to gain, gain any kind of support 
or any people standing behind us. We, we, we um, as a committee and as a school district, um, sometimes have to make difficult decisions. This is one of the most difficult ones that, that we've had to make, but we certainly, we certainly don't look for um, any type of reinforcement. If we have to make a decision, we make a decision, um, that's that. And for future reference, um, any boards or committees that have any questions um, regarding what may be, may be um, conceived as, as a false narrative, just reach out to us. You can make a phone call, email any of us. We'd be glad to, again, collaborate, build consensus with you. Um, so um, that was well said, Dr. Hanfield, but I don't think, I, I was never mistaken in, in, in the voice of the admin team. Just, it was pretty clear. But thanks for the comments anyway. It's always better to, to build bridges than, than burn them. Uh, I'm starting to learn that. Kind of. Any other comments? Well said, Judge. Thank you. All right, moving on to unfinished business. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so as we did most of our December 9th meeting to um, the FY22 draft budget um, that evening, uh, you heard from the principals and department heads uh, regarding accomplishments and expected accomplishments in, in both this year and in fiscal year 22. Um, tonight, the rest of the items that, that comprise the FY22 budget, um, as well as the considerations, um, will be presented um, as we discussed on December 9th. And then um, I'll ask the, the committee um, for a, a, a vote to send the draft FY22 number four to the town administration. Um, so I'm going to, I'm two for two so far. Let's see if I can make it three for three on the screen share. Um, everybody, everybody see that? No. Oh, hold on, sorry. Jinxed myself. <laughs> hold on, I'll, it'll come back. Maybe. You see it now? No. It says we are Auburn. Then we're good. We're close. Perfect. <laughs> Let me just back it up. There we go. I'm getting there. So anyway, um, if you just indulge me for a, 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 a few moments, and obviously if you have questions, please, we, we can discuss this. Um, but as I, as I said, um, and this is also, by the way, this is also the entire part one and two um, is posted to our website in the news and announcements section. It's also posted um, in the um, uh, school business uh, office area uh, posting as well. So if people wanna see one and two um, in any event. So as we talked about uh, on, the, um, on the 9th of December, this really is a response and recovery budget. Um, and as I said at the outset, you know, we heard from the principals and department heads and, and um, you know, the long, long list and you have it in their executive summaries and their other information of, of all the things that we're doing here in the schools. And, and as we do every year, you know, again, just to, to quickly summarize, you know, it's predicated on, you know, our mission, our vision and our core values. And um, that's really what drives everything that we do. Uh, and I'm not going to go through and read all of these. Um, they're just here for the, you know, for people, for the narrative, um, if they're following at home um, or if they're reading them, um, just so they can kind of see how the pieces connect. On the ninth, we talked a little bit about, you know, the first part of the budget being the response and, and, and how we've responded to COVID um, during this fiscal year. And I outlined kind of, you know, where we were starting with that day in March when we closed schools for coronavirus. We talked about um, on the 9th, you know, the reopening of our schools and, and what a paradigm shift it, it really was um, and what our concerns were, you know, and, and continue to be, you know, educating in a pandemic era, um, what the school looked like and feel like in, in this, this environment. You know, you heard a little bit from Jasmine tonight about what she thinks it looks and feels like right now. And I think that's true for, for all of us. We talked about our focus on academic gaps and social and, and, and emotional needs of our kids. 
Um, and we talked about, you know, pushing forward to remediate, introduce new material, and address social emotional concerns of our kids. And so we continue to do that this year. We summarized kind of where we were with the FY21 budget. We talked about the number um, that was passed at, at town meeting in June of 2020. Then we talked about how um, a shortfall in revenue brought us back to our FY20 appropriation. Um, and then we talked about how the town uh, was able to add some monies back to us and how they were able to do that. And then we talked about the revised FY21 number that was adopted in October at our special fall town meeting ultimately showing an overall decrease of $461,898 for fiscal year 21. And again, the majority of that being the shortfall in the Student Opportunities Act not being funded. And then the balance of that, you know, was just a, a shortfall in revenue. But the vast majority of the monies that, that were missing were from the Student Opportunities Act not funded. And then we discussed, you know, well, so how did we offset this money? Well, we offset this money through the grants that we, we received. And we talked a lot about, you know, what those grants looked like. And again, I have them posted here. Um, again, I'm not going to go through them all, but they were, they were substantial monies that were one-time affordances to us that helped kind of bridge that gap between the, the SOA money um, not coming in and, and the small shortfall on the town side. The downside to this, though, although it was a huge shot in the arm for us this year, is that the Student Opportunities Act money is monies that um, are, are earmarked to go into your foundation budget. And so not having that money in the foundation budget hurts a little bit long term because instead of building on our original appropriation from June, you're now, you know, about, you know, a little less than half a million dollars beneath that. Um, but either way, um, we, you know, we made it happen between working with the town and, and what we had from the state. So, um, but again, it's what I call soft money. It, we can't guarantee that it's gonna be there in, in fiscal year 21, or 22 rather, excuse me. So, um, you know, as we look at fiscal year 22, it's about the recovery, right? As vaccines are coming forward, we're not out of the woods, um, but we're hoping that we're gonna be in a much better place um, overall, but we still will be recovering. Um, we anticipate a full return to school in the fall of 2021. Um, what that exactly looks like yet, we don't know. I mean, we say a full return, but what will that full return look like? That will unfold in the coming months. Um, we anticipate continuing to deal with the impact COVID has had on our kids academically and socially and emotionally for the for foreseeable future. Um, we really don't know. And I don't think we're gonna know what the full ramifications are of, of COVID on our kids, um, you know, for at least maybe 10 years, you know, until we're able to kind of follow in, in you know, in a longitudinal manner you know, what, what this looks like for our kids starting in preschool and what they look like when they exit high school. Um, so in any event, with that said, on December 9th, as I said, the department heads and principals presented what they expected to accomplish this year um, and, and, on, and next year uh, based on what we, what we knew at that point. And so nothing's changed in, in about a month. You know, FY22 again promises to be a lean budget year. Um, we don't have any new positions coming in, in this year's budget, as we discussed um, on December the 9th. Um, we have our classroom supply lines uh, level funded. And um, we're really trying to seek, you know, to maintain our current staffing levels, um, unless there's an emergent need. And as we've demonstrated in the past, and as you have supported, um, you know, if we do need to add additional staff, be it a teacher or, or whatever, um, you know, you've always supported that. And so that, that still would be the plan moving forward. If, if we had an emergent need, of course, we would, we would act to, to remedy that, um, depending on what the situation was. So continuing with the theme of response and recovery and understanding that FY22 is going to be tight and there are many uncertainties, again, you know, no additional faculty and staff, you know, level funded building and department supply lines, um, the balance of, of our budgetary considerations, as I said at the outset, will be presented tonight. Um, and it's really focused on the district strategic plan and your priorities that you've set as a school committee. Um, so tonight we'll talk a little bit about what we're assuming um, in, that will be in play for the budget. Uh, we'll talk about some projections that we've made. Uh, and we'll talk about the unknowns. Um, as I said at the outset, this is a draft number um, and uh, we'll, we'll see how it evolves in the coming months. 
So just to refresh everybody's memories, in, in November of, of 2017, um, we redid our second uh, strategic plan under the leadership of Dr. Brunel. Uh, and there were five areas that at that time we identified and are still in play um, that we were going to craft our strategic plan around. Teaching and learning, technology, health, wellness, and safety, transitions, community partnerships. And so the budget that we've put together reflects our, com our continued commitment to these areas um, and uh, as they were approved by you um, in the spring of 2018. So teaching and learning um, is the first one and class size of course is, is always the one of the, the primary concerns um, in keeping with the school committee's expectations that reflect class sizes of 25 or lower. Um, we, um, we've projected out for next year um, the following class sizes. You can see it at the kindergarten at Bryn Mawr and Pack, um, roughly 21. In grade one, it's 22 at Bryn Mawr and 19 at Pack. In grade two at Bryn Mawr and Pack, it's 23. The same in grade three, 22 in grade four, 23 in grade five, 24 apiece in grades six, seven, and eight. Um, and then at the high school, it varies between 16 and 24. Um, Sometimes it runs a little bit higher, sometimes it runs a little bit lower. Depends on the nature of the courses that are running, um, what, be it advanced placement, core, um, remedial, whatever the case may be. So, um, so we feel good about that. Uh, we feel good about what the class sizes will be moving into next year. Um, and, you know, again, these are approximations. You know, I mean, things can change, but, um, you know, looking at, at, um, at what we expect, you know, for our student population size next year. We're very comfortable with where we are um, moving into next year. Technology, um, funded obviously through our CIP, um, the operating budget, school choice, and grant funds, most especially this year, grant funds. Um, we're gonna continue to maintain our one-to-one -one iPad initiative that we have in place um, for grades K through 12. Um, in, in the past, it had been six through 12, and we were trying to start to move things down into K to five. Um, but now, I think what we've all come to realize is that, um, you know, the, the whole idea of, of remote, synchronous, hybrid, whatever you want to call it, um, that element of learning is here to stay. That door is wide open now, and we've got to continue to be prepared. Um, and our kids have to be um, in a place where they can easily navigate between in-person, what I'll call traditional learning, and utilization of, of technology and iPads. Um, so uh, we will continue to, to move forward in, in the development of a, of a robust K-12 um, uh, inventory, if you will, um, of, of uh, you know, synchronous learning opportunities and, and, and remote learning uh, opportunities, because we just don't know. You know, I think COVID-19 has taught us, you know, at any, at any point in time, you know, God forbid we could have something else happen. We don't want to necessarily have, you know, a, a repeat of last spring. Not that it was awful, but it certainly wasn't great. And I think it was because, you know, we just weren't in a place where we were projecting something like this to happen. So um, this will, will stay at the forefront of what we're doing uh, moving into next year and presumably for the foreseeable future. Professional development, um, as you have heard a number of times in the past, professional development is um, something that's extremely important in our school district. Our staff, um, it, uh, faculty and staff rather, are, are, are extremely uh, invested in, in furthering their, their own knowledge and skill as it relates to the classroom. And so we have um, you know, ample funds in there to support that. We're also working hard to um, build in-house capacity. Research is very clear that teachers learn best from teachers, or at least that's who they prefer to learn from. Um, and we also know that embedding initiatives and programs into schools always has much better success when colleagues are supporting colleagues. So we're, we're continuing to focus on that initiative as well. When we look to student achievement, we're continuing to obviously look at improving. We're, we're a district that's dedicated to continuous improvement. I think um, our, our, you know, our activities over the last several years, um, you know, have, have demonstrated that we will continue to promote preschool, you know, for our, our town's youngest children, and, and we will work hard to remove any sort of barriers that will, would otherwise preclude them from attending um, preschool. 
we will continue all of our before and after school um, opportunities that give our students opportunities to excel. Um, we'll continue what's become a very successful Encore program um, at Central Office for our 18 to 22 um, population. And we'll continue to support our kids in things such as, you know, unified athletics, so on and so forth. In terms of health, wellness, and safety, obviously, you know, that's paramount and, and that's our primary focus before we can do anything else. Um, we will continue um, to uh, work with our faculty and staff as part of the response and recovery theme, not only for them, uh, because our, our faculty and staff have, have needs, um, you know, both, both psychologically and, and um, you know, in terms of teaching. Um, we are committed to maintaining a strong and stable nursing corps within the APS. This year, we, with your um, approval, uh, we were able to add two additional full-time nurses uh, to our nursing corps. They have been invaluable to, um, you know, our ability to, to run schools and, and run them safely. And so this budget reflects uh, the, the, the maintaining um, of those positions. Again, providing ABA and IA support to assist students where it's necessary. Um, we do have funds uh, in this year's budget um, to keep buildings safe. Um, both structurally and just from, you know, just from outside threats uh, and responding proactively to those threats. Um, we'll continue to provide our students with safe co-curricular activities, uh, as we've always done. And this year, too, I think what we've also done, and it's the last bullet point in this slide, is that we will maintain our focus on providing healthy and nutritious meals to students and families. Um, what we've come to real well, we've known this, but I think the, the I think COVID really has highlighted it and underscored the importance of it. We know that our children, you know, and their families by extension, they need to eat. They need to be eating nutritious meals if they're going to be in a place where they can um, access learning in, in, in the most favorable manner. And so we're we're looking at you know um, maintaining our very popular meals to go program. Um, and speaking with um, Mrs. King today. Um, we're still at about that 600 number for families that we're, we're servicing. Um, we're also um, working with families who qualify um, to involve themselves in the pandemic EBT program. Um, that's a, a, a service that's work, that works through transitional assistance um, where students are able to purchase meals and things like that if they qualify. Um, so, uh, so we're looking to continue that moving into into next school year. And just along that line, um, I know that a topic every year is, you know, what, what is the free and reduced meals data look like? Um, you can see here in this, this chart that I made for all of you, um, by school, going from AHS down to Pakachog, and then if you go across there, um, you can see the free um, qualified students uh, in, in each building. Um, and it's a, it's, a, it's a good amount. You can see the reduced um, number, not as high. Um, and then the total number there um, of total uh, free and reduced students and our students who pay, and then um, what the total enrollment is. But when you look over here in this column here by school, you know, you can see that we're running, that, that's a pretty high number. You know, that's a pretty high number. You know, you're looking at almost a quarter of our students um, you know, uh, being eligible for, for free and a reduced lunch. That's an important number, and, and we need to continue to serve those, those students um, to the best of our ability. So um, those numbers, too, um, although it kind of goes beyond the scope of this presentation tonight, but in looking at those numbers going back, you know, four or five years, they're relatively consistent. Um, you see some, some increases in some places, um, but we've always kind of hovered, you know, on the aggregate, um, among all schools, we kind of have always hovered around that 24 to 26% range. So there's a number of students and families in, in our district that, that, that need that assistance. Um, and so we're, we're committed to continue to provide it. In terms of transitions, you know, uh, this isn't probably new news, but we'll say it again. You know, we, we feel it's so imperative that we help our students adapt to new surroundings so that they can feel safe and comfortable. Um, and be ready to achieve. We know that anxiety levels and stress and things of that nature when kids aren't feeling well, right? Think about it as adults. When we're not feeling well and in good places, 
um, you know, it's very difficult to turn our attention to anything academic. Um, and so even in this place, even in this COVID space that we're in right now, um, you know, we've continued to do that. We've had introductions and, and transition activities to new faces and places, PK to 12. Um, we've had a variety of Zoom transition activities to start the school year. Um, we had students that elected. We did have a number of students elect to return to school at the end of trimester one. So we had socially distanced transition activities uh, in the middle and high schools especially. We also had the parents come in if they wanted to, um, to kind of help you know, ease the transition if there was some angst um, you know, on the part of the parent as well about what does the school look like on the inside. A lot of the things that we did kind of in that June, uh, July, August period for folks, um, we, we did again at the end of trimester one. Um, you know, there were personal transitions that were, that were done totally uh, with the, the principals. Um, they devoted their time in, into acclimating, you know, our kids and our families back. Um, and, you know, right now as we look forward, um, we're looking forward to transitioning back to school. You know, I mean, fingers crossed, maybe end of year. I mean, I, I don't know. I'm just spitballing right now. But, um, you know, when we talk about transitions, there's going to have to be some sort of a transition back into school. Um, when we get to that place, um, it, it, I don't think it, it can just be, um, okay, here you go, everybody, you know, you're back in school now. Um, I think for a lot of reasons, uh, I think both our, the, the faculty, staff, and our kids are going to need um, some sort of a, a transition process back in. So we're focusing on that. And then I think, as I said at the outset, you know, we're preparing for a full fall return, um, what that looks like, you know, is still to, yet to be determined. We have to go through you know, the coming months, um, but that very much is, is on our, our mind and, um, and in part of our budget as well. Community partnerships, you know, our community stands together and I, I will say that, you know, this year has been probably the year of all years where our community has stand together. During our community partnerships presentations in previous years, we're usually talking about outside groups and outside agencies, um, and they're very, very important to us, but in this COVID period, it's just been so difficult to maintain, you know, say example, relationships with Auburn Life Care, um, you know, and, and other groups like that, because we, this, that daily interaction or the visiting or things like that, just, we haven't been able to do that with, with COVID. Um, but we have been able to maintain pretty strong relationships with Auburn Youth and Family. Um, the Chamber of Commerce has been great. Um, the town in general, I can't say enough about town administration and their support. Um, you know, of the schools, and that goes from, from you know, town manager Jacobson to CFO Kazanovitz to, you know, Chief Slukas to Chief Coleman, um, you know, um, uh, the DPW, um, anything that we've needed um, or, or, or had a question about, they've been there. Um, I've already talked a lot about, you know, the amazing job that, in, in, that the Department of Health and Inspectional Services has done for us, um, and we work in unison with them. Um, to do things like we'll be we'll be starting a um, uh, the the tier one or the the first wave of of, of um, vaccinations are going to start to be taking place for um, emergency uh, management folks and and as um, as a we have a mass inoculation um, program and so uh, just as an example Beth and I and Darlene and, and Chief Coleman met over the over the break um, to talk about how we could start. Um, you know, working to get um, folks in, in the District 7 part of Massachusetts, you know, inoculated um, here in the town. So, um, you know, the return to school committee, I mean, that was made up of, of townspeople, parents, kids, business owners. Um, they, were, they were huge in putting together that return to school document that's on our website. Um, the Meals to Go program, which I've mentioned. And Staples has stepped up and been tremendous. Staples has made two... Um, uh, large donations they've been they've been kind of collecting back to school supplies just randomly um and Kristen pappas has made uh, two drop-offs um one at the middle school and one at swanson road and so um we, we couldn't do this it takes a village you know to to do what we do and even in spite of covid you know we're still able to stand together and so um you know we, we will continue with this moving into the fall and we look forward to reacquainting ourselves and getting back into some of the other places that we've we've worked with for so many years once COVID um, has has hopefully been mitigated to the point where we can do that. 
So the assumptions and projections um, for FY22, um, as we always do every year, the October 1st counts were used in terms of students at each grade level to ensure that the data was consistent. Um, those numbers you know, have already changed a little bit. Um, we've level funded grant monies from the 240 grant that um, helps um, supplant special education um, in the Title IIA grant as offsets to reduce our budget number. Um, we're projecting a Medicaid reimbursement to be about $150,000 um, as approved at the annual town meeting, while also using anticipated carryover funds from previous years if available. We think there may be some Medicaid funds that we can carry forward, but we don't know yet. Um, special Education Circuit Breaker, um, we're anticipating to come in at $304,457. The state's telling us that they expect to reimburse Circuit Breaker at about 75%, um, which is pretty good. That's, that's as high as it's been in, in, a, in a bit. There were years when they were struggling to hit 55%. Um, so we're going on that assumption there. Uh, we'll continue to participate in our school choice program um, with our current seats, which stands at 100. Um, but we will review that. Um, we actually, tonight, um, we have to take, well, the committee, if they so choose to continue with school choice, uh, we have to take our, the motion this evening so we can notify the state um, that we're participating. Um, and our instructional assistants and our ABAs um, have noted they've They've been noted in their current assignments, but at the end of every school year, based on students' needs, um, IAs and ABAs, they fluctuate um, their assignment. And, and so, um, you know, that's kind of a, a moving target. So as was the case in FY21, um, we've continued to budget um, 11 school buses, um, making the assumption that ridership will stay the same as this current year, um, assuming that we're going to maintain the current bus fee um, uh, that's currently in place with no changes in that. Um, $100,000 can be used as an offset. Um, we'll continue to utilize offsets and revolving accounts, including building rentals, satellite galaxy, um, you know, preschool athletic revolving. Um, oil pricing has been procured already um, for FY22 at $1.6999 per gallon. Um, which will provide a savings of roughly $13,000 to the budget compared to last fiscal year. Um, that's about a 30 cent reduction in oil price um, over last year. Uh, we have the solar panels on the roofs of both AMS and AHS uh, that were installed in the winter. Um, we've budgeted conservatively for what we may get for um, a return only because we don't have um, a full year's worth of data yet on, on what those panels um, and what the money's uh, realized will be. So um, we, we've taken kind of a rather conservative approach with that until we have a full year's worth of data um, to make some more accurate predictions. Overall, uh, we have $2,555,967 in offsets that we have to help put toward um, the fiscal year 22 budget. So the draft number um, before you this evening is $27,988,540.45. Uh, this represents a 2.89% increase or about $785,000 um, over the approved October town meeting amount of $27,214,157. And if we go back, and I think this is important, and that's why I put it in, if we go back to the number that was approved in June of 2020, um, this is actually a 0.99% or $312,485 increase over the June town meeting approval, uh, approved amount of 27,676,055. Um, we feel that this budget is extremely um, uh, fiscally responsible uh, for the taxpayers of Auburn without compromising, and this is the key, without compromising educational services um, to our students uh, during what is a very unprecedented time in the country and in the world. Um, and again, as I've said all along, um, this budget's been created to continue to respond and recover uh, from the impact COVID has and will have um, on our children in their academic and social and emotional well-being. 
moving forward, uh, it's a long way to May. That's a phrase that uh, I picked up for business managers ago. Cecilia and I were laughing about it earlier today um, because that was always the mantra of this individual. Um, basically saying where we are now is more than likely nowhere where we will be in May just because there's so many topsy-turvy pieces to this that have still yet to be, um, to be realized. What we do know um, is that uh, the town uh, is planning for a, a 2.75 uh, increase per department. Um, so that's a positive. That's a positive. In this climate, um, to come across with a, you know, a 2.75 increase is, is positive. So we're, we're very excited to see that and hope that that comes to fruition. Um, what we don't know yet um, on the state level is what the governor's budget will be and what our preliminary chapter 70 money will be because um, obviously with everything being delayed, um, we're not expecting to see those until midwinter and midwinter in our world is you know mid-February. So we have to await to see what those numbers will look like. We also have to wait and see, you know, what are the Student Opportunity Act implications gonna be for fiscal year 22? The state is still committed to funding it. Um, in fact, they asked for, um, uh, updated um, applications. Um, and so we've done that. Dr. Chamberlain did a terrific job in, in penning that and sending it to the state. So we will see you know, if we realize any monies from that for fiscal year 22. There's leadership changes in Washington and we don't know, you know, we know that there's a stimulus coming forward. We don't know what is in, is in that right now um, specifically. Um, and we don't know what will be there moving into FY22 because there's discussion in Washington that you know, there'll be an additional stimulus bill on top of the one that was just passed. So as I said, uh, I believe on the 9th of December, um, per the town charter, the draft budget has to be to the town manager um, by the second Monday in January, uh, which is January 11th this year. And then once it's su submitted to the town, we, we will await support on the budget and, and making it, um, you know, hopefully come to fruition as numbers are known and, and other things, you know, uh, kind of take place. And, um, you know, as I said, as evidenced last year with, with having to, to downturn the, the, the budget number um, in October, I mean, that could happen too. It could go the other way. Um, but that's, that's kind of where we are right now. So um, with that, if there's any, i turn it back to Mr. Chair. I would entertain a, <clears throat> a motion to recommend. I make a motion to approve the FY22 draft school budget number of $27,988,540.45 and to forward this draft number to town administration to comply with the town charter requirements. I'll second that. Is there any discussion? Um, no, thank you. Uh, if, if there's nothing else, that Casey, Dr. Hanfield, um, thanks for, for putting that together for us. And um, that certainly is um, great news that the town is able to come across with that um, 2.75. That's certainly going to be helpful um, no matter what the outlook is. So definitely great news. And um, it, it's always expected that there'll be some changes. So that was a, sure. that was a, a, a funny little... Uh, line there though and I do I do recall that but um but yeah we expect changes it's so fluid um yeah. nothing new for us here yeah no it, it is and I and I you know like I said I, I like you know we have you know historically you know uh, during the last 15 or so years that I've been in the district this is my 16th you know we really have worked hard especially <clears throat> you know under Dr. Brunel's leadership you know starting in 2009-10 um you know, of really bringing forward, you know, budgets that are fiscally responsible. We're not asking for more than what we need to get the job done. Um, but also at the same time, don't compromise the education of our, of our students because at the end of the day, that's what we're here to do. You know, we're here to educate our kids and we're here to advocate for our kids. Um, and so, I, I, you know, it's a very delicate line, you know, that you walk because, you know, you, you've got to be mindful you know, of, of the pie, if you will, on the town. Um, and to your earlier comments, Mr. Scobie, you know, yes, it's, it's collaboration. And, and, and I think one of the things that makes things work in town right now so well is that there is collaborative efforts among boards and departments and, 
you know, people understand, you know, kind of big picture, you know, how everything goes together. So um, I'm, I'm pleased with this and, um, you know, um, I'm certain that town management will be, will be, uh, will be pleased with it as well. Excellent. Any other comments? Roll call vote. Ms. Harrington? Yes. Ms. Holloway? Yes. Ms. Kaufman? Yes. Dr. McCrillis? Yes. And Mr. Scobie, yes. It is a vote. Thanks again. Moving on. Great. Thank you. Um, just uh, we have one item under new business um, per Mass General Law, um, Massachusetts school districts are required to vote uh, annually um, on their uh, decision to continue in school choice. Um, school choice has become, um, or the school choice program in Auburn, I should say, has become an important part of our budget, um, but over the last decade, but I'll, I'll say more than that, um, you know, the wonderful students that we have had the opportunity and families that we have had the opportunity to interact with and, and welcome into our school community um, has really been enriching. And so, um, you know, as we prepare for the FY22 budget, it's my recommendation that we continue the school choice program. The numbers, again, um, you know, to go back to what, you know, it's a long way to May. Um, you know, I'm asking that, you know, that, that the motion be made to adopt it early. I mean, January is kind of early. We don't really need to do it until the spring. But to have the flexibility to be able to, you know, look at things as they materialize on the budget front, um, but also to be able to look at things as they materialize, you know, on the school choice front, um, you know, to be able to have that flexibility is really, you know, why it's, it's before you this evening. Um, so um, it's my recommendation that we, we continue it. Um, and uh, if there would be anything drastic with, with it beyond what we're currently doing, um, certainly I would bring it back to the committee for discussion. Um, but um, this just gives me the ability to, to operate, you know, to navigate within, you know, continuing to construct the budget and refine it, knowing that we have this officially um, on the books from the committee. That's great. And, and um, <clears throat> I would just echo your sentiments um, over, over the years, Dr. Burnell would, would provide us actually with um, positive comment, commentary regarding uh, school choice students, but, but she would also um, once in a while provide us with, with um, the, the details and, um, you know, the details as they apply to attendance, discipline, um, grade point averages, and that type of thing. And, and, and not to say that that's the end all, um, because I think just the relationships, as you said, that, that the students form with, with one another and they form with the students from out of districts and the, in the, the um, relationships that we form with the families, really that's, um, that's invaluable. So the whole experience has been great. I would just um, ask that maybe down the road, maybe um, the middle of next year, um, we, we, um, we, we put together some data um, like, like we have in the past, um, sure. just, to, just to show the, the, the general public, the, those three or four people watching at home. Um, Mrs. You know, Guitar. Well, yeah, Mrs. Guitar. <laughs> Hello, Mrs. Hi, Guitar. Mrs. Guitar. Hello. Happy New Year. <laughs> what the, what that school choice is all about, because it's actually a very, um, very positive program. It is, and I, you know, I have the, um, you know, I, I have the, the luxury of, um, you know, as you know, uh, having been here for, you know, 15 years as a high school principal, um, you know, uh, the, the, the children that, that we would welcome into our school choice program, um, by and large, just the nicest kids, the nicest families, um, you know, truly looking for a better educational option than what they currently had. And, you know, that's really what the whole school choice program was, was predicated on was to try to bring kind of a business model um, to schools, to school improvement, that if schools knew that they could possibly lose students and then the, 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 the dollar amount associated, you know, in the foundation budget, that, that they would work harder to maintain their own students. Um, and so, you know, Auburn's been very fortunate that, you know, we are a desirable district to many families. Um, and so, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's really, you know, it, it's, 
not only helped us financially, but it's also really enriched, you know, our school community. Um, so uh, yeah, I would be happy to, to provide that data. Um, you know, I often joke, but it's the truth. Um, you know, some of our, they, they outperform in, in many cases, um, you know, a lot of our kids, um, you know, that, that live in Auburn. Um, but it's just not beyond academics. It's just what they bring to us socially and they're just tremendous, tremendous families. And, um, and the other thing is we build relationships with them because many of them have siblings. And so once one's accepted, if there are siblings, um, you know, there's that, that sibling preference, you know? So I can think of one family in Spencer right now where they had four kids come through our, 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 our district um, and just, just the nicest, just wonderful. You know, you still, still talk to them today, still see them today. Um, and so, yeah, it, 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 it's more than just the financial piece. It, it, it's the enrichment, you know, of, of the school community and, and as well. So definitely an add all the way around. Absolutely. Well, I would entertain that motion. Choice program in the Auburn Public Schools and to allow the superintendent to decide what number of students into the district will be after reviewing demographic data more closely. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. Any, any further discussion? Okay, roll call vote, Mrs. Harrington? Yes. Mrs. Holloway? Yes. Mrs. Kaufman? Yes. Dr. McCrillis? Yes. And Mr. Scobie, yes, it is a vote. Thank you. Thank you. And we now move on to, did you have anything else before teaching and learning? No, Mr. Chair, I do not. Thank you very much. All right. Dr. Chamberlain. You're, you're muted, Dr. Chamberlain. Yes, I am. Sorry about that. So thank you all. Um, you'd think we'd get over that by now, but it happens all the time. A um, few things to report on tonight. So shortly after Thanksgiving, uh, we did conduct a very brief survey of families and staff related to their learning experience, given the new environment within which we are currently uh, working. And I gave you just some overall, um, again, it was a very simple survey, um, but in general, our families and our staff are satisfied with how things are going. Um, so 83% or more of our families are happy with in-person learning and that the learning platforms are accessible and easy to navigate. That was something that we heard uh, very loudly back in the spring, that that was very difficult for many of our families, finding things, you know, finding links, um, finding the materials they need. And it seems that we've made some significant improvements in that area. You know, we're not perfect, but um, for the most part, uh, folks were very happy. 87% um, or more note that the teacher provides regular feedback to their child and 91% know how our, their children can get extra help or um, additional support when needed, which um, in this environment, again, is really important, right? We want to make sure that when kids need something, they're able to access that um, and the feedback shows that they are. Um, and then over 80% note that we have just the right amount of safety measures and 98% find the communication from schools um, somewhat or extremely helpful. So some really good signs. I will tell you that there were many comments made um, and some of the comments were um, very positive and others were like, we just need to get back to normal, but we know we can't, right? That was a resounding thing. We want all of our kids back, but we know right now we can't get there. Um, and so I think everyone particularly now remains hopeful that that will come sooner than later, as Dr. Hanfield talked about, but, you know, time will tell on how that plays out. But for the most part, that was the feedback was that let's get them back, but we know it's not time yet, you know, so uh, hopefully that time will come. Again, the vast majority of staff are satisfied with how things are going at schools and feel that the learning environment is effective and that they're able to engage students in the learning with over 85% uh, reporting that remote, the remote learning tools that are available to them are effective. So that was something else that back in the spring, um, it was clear that uh, teachers still needed things, right? They needed some of those technology tools. And we continue to add to that. We recently um, just purchased some things for Swanson Road that's going to make that synchronous interaction with kids at home easier. 
Um, so we continue to push on it, but I think um, those are pretty good results. And 97% of staff reported being somewhat or extremely satisfied with the support from school leadership, right, which is critical that that relationship is established and positive, and them being also satisfied with the communications. Uh, the teachers were also asked about what professional development that they would most um, feel beneficial moving forward. For teachers, it was around social emotional learning, and we know that, and we continue to share information with them on that. Um, and Dr. Hanfield and I have been hand talking about a plan moving forward with how we're going to provide additional support around that. And support staff um, was still really looking for some support around technology use. Um, they, they've been kind of, when I talk about support staff, some of the instructional assistants that provide small group learning and that kind of thing, um, that's coming along, but we do have a plan in place uh, to be able to provide them with some additional support that way as well. So in general, um, you know, we were well in the positive range in the responses that we heard. Um, but, you know, I think everybody just wants it to be more normal than it is, right? And, and we just need a bit more time to do that. So um, we were pleased with that. I suspect in short time, you know, probably maybe around March or so, we'll do another one um, to just see where we stand with things. And in the meantime, principals have been working to kind of tease through school specific data um, and look at you know specific parent comments and that kind of thing and follow up on that and share it with their staff but i think in general we were very uh pleased with the results that we got from the surveys did anyone have any questions about any of that um through the share i just do it's more of a request than a question um i think it's very interesting that the teachers are requesting information on social and emotional learning particularly because when the kids are at home, that is got to be such a challenge to try to read, you know, the emotions of the 20 little heads you see on the screen. So I, I would really just be curious to see what you guys are able to come up with specifically for our kids that are at home at a later date, if you guys are able to find some helpful programs to deal with that remotely. Yeah, so I think to some degree, you know, and I think Jasmine kind of hit that tonight, right, around that motivation. Right. right. And I think, you know, Casey said it too. I, I think it's hard for all of us sometimes, right? <laughs> Some days I'm like, oh, I just don't want to do another Zoom, you know? <laughs> but I, out of bed. Yeah. I think, you know, really what I see staff finding, so it was funny, I got this little video that um, the folks at Boston Dynamics had done to get these um, robots to dance to this. Mm -hmm. uh, are. It was just great. So I sent it to a couple of teachers at the middle school. I don't know why I had been in their classroom. I'm like, oh, they might like this. And one of them wrote back and she's like, it's already in my lesson plan for today, she said, because those are the kind of things, right? So I, right. I know it's disconnected from social emotional learning, but it isn't, right? Because what does it bring? It brings a little bit of a joy, uh, you know, a, a, that kind of joy into the learning process. And so I think, you know, that's why teachers are trying to hit that sweet spot with some of that because there's always that push, right? We need to get through the material, but it's so important to back up and find the joy that can be brought into that learning. That's why we're excited about this blessed sandbox. I'm gonna tell you, what, you know, like that just, it brings excitement. And I think right now through all of COVID, that's just been, it's been hard to maintain, you know? Um, yeah. like if you're pushing on those things, I just shared out some learning from Desi that came out and, um, it, it, it's trial and error to some degree. And especially certain kids need certain things and other kids need other things. So it isn't sure. like if you do one thing, it's gonna make, it's gonna meet the needs of everybody, right? Um, but I know our teachers are doing tremendous outreach to make sure that they're personally connecting with kids. And I think that's gonna go a long way too through the spring. Um, but you know, you know, teachers are type A. They always think, oh, I can do better, right? I can do a little bit more. And um, they're always looking that way. So yeah, we're, we're working on it. Okay, thank you. Yeah, how was, um, I know like, were there any trends within specific schools or were we pretty much around that 80 to 90 across the district? Yeah, it was very, it was interesting. It was very similar. There were some variations, maybe between five and seven percentage points. But to me, in this kind of a random survey, that's not a big discrepancy. Um, so yeah, no, everything was very similar across the board. All right, I 
there aren't any other questions. You'll also see in your packet, I shared with you um, an updated print version of the data dashboard, which now includes a second page. I wasn't as fancy. I didn't know we were screen sharing tonight, Dr. Hanfield, or I would have pulled this up too. Awesome. Um, so we talked, we've, we spent a lot of talk, time talking about what attendance data can we show, right? And, and how can we show it? And, and, and so we, we did go through and we've put something together by cohort um, because we felt that the cohorts were important because they're very different, right? With when they come in and, and all of that. And I think um, if you look at it, this, the interactive chart is much better because you can kind of hover over the bar and it will give you the actual percent when you're looking at it online. This is not live yet because I wanted to show it to all of you um, first before it's uh, live to the public. Um, but it does kind of give you, you know, an overall, if you just look across the board on that, um, on the first part of it, that cohort A's average um, attendance rate is 96%. That's, we're doing it on a monthly basis. So October, November, and December are shown here. Um, cohort B, 95%, cohort C, 86, D at 93, and E at 94%. So a little bit lower than we'd like to be, but I think given um, the current scenario, not bad. Principals are looking at their cohort C students. You know, some of this gets impacted by when a family gets impacted by a quarantine result right, and our cohort C group is smaller, much smaller than the rest of the groups. Um, so, you know, a family of four that might be out because they have to quarantine can have an impact on, um, on those rates. So there are a lot of variations that go into it, um, but I do think over time, this is going to give us some really valuable data. So I don't know if anyone had any questions on any of that. Any questions for Dr. Chamberlain? Oh, thank no, you. I, just, I like the further breakdown. So thank you very much. Great. Definitely. <clears throat> and finally, I share with you again in your packet, um, there was a report from Desi at the top. It just said December 10th, 2020. Um, back in early November, all districts across the state were charged with completing a survey on structured learning time within the district. Um, they looked at four grade levels, grade one, four, seven, and 10. You had to um, fill out the amount of time that students were in person, the amount of time students learned remotely, um, and the amount of time that they had synchronous learning during that remote learning time, um, along with special populations like our cohort D students who come five days a week. So they gathered all that data um, and from that, they did an analysis across the state and they came up with some requirements that they decided that districts were going to have to meet related to in-person learning. In-person learning be, being in, either in the school in person or synchronously in the remote environment. And uh, the, we are considered a hybrid district, district because all students are given the opportunity to come in at least some of the time. So overall, our model is a hybrid model. So we are required to provide an average of at least 35 hours of live instruction over two academic weeks. And so if you see at the bottom of that page, um, the, it shows what our live instruction hours are for each of those grade levels, with grade one being 35 hours, grade four, 42, grade seven, 51, and grade 10, 46. So we are well within the range of what they um, asked for, uh, you know, recommended that we do. There are many districts across the state that are now scrambling um, to change their model to increase their live um, instructional time. And the new requirements really go into effect on January 19th. Several weeks after that, we'll have to do this survey again. Um, to just kind of verify that we are meeting what the state has asked us to do. Um, but I think we were very pleased with the results that um, we are, you know, quite handily meeting this requirement. And that's due in large part to the hard work of principals and teachers in each building, um, really making those connections with kids and making sure that we have those kids tethered to school. So I don't know if anyone has any questions about that. Any questions or comments? 
No, I'd, I'd go to the chair. I just think it's a testament to all of the hard work that everyone put into this over the summer that we got it right. So thank you so much for all the work that went into that. Thank it's really you. excellent to hear. Thank you. Absolutely, and, th and thanks for sharing that data with us in, in, in such detail, Dr. Chamberlain. I always appreciate it. Great, thank you. Even though Dr. Hanfield put it up on the screen, we still appreciate the fact that you were very detailed. <laughs> Dr. Hanfield took a big risk tonight in doing that, and it, it worked for the most part, so that's okay. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> I'm getting any other comments? With it. Any other comments or questions for Dr. Chamberlain? Seeing none, um, what would usually be a very difficult act to follow, but we have um, someone very special um, delivering us the business and financial report. Cecilia. Uh-oh, I think she left us. You're gonna miss your favorite part of the night, George. <laughs> after all that build up. <laughs> Cecilia, are you with us? Turn her mic's off. Can you no, hear me? She, yes, there you go. I can hear you. <laughs> you can hear me now. Okay, I'm sorry about that. I'm I'm playing between my computer and my phone, so I wasn't sure which one I was <laughs> supposed to be unmuting. I unmuted the phone. But anyways, good evening, everyone. Um, on December 10th, uh, 2020, Superintendent Hanfield, Mr. Fahey, and I met with Town Manager Jacobson and CFO Casanovas to discuss the school department's capital plan. We discussed the possibility of switching out some of the projects slated for FY22 that could be pushed out a year to make room for some of the air quality improvements listed that we had listed in FY2026. Um, that being with the Atmos Air, we felt like if we could kind of continue to build on that in FY22, that that would be a good thing to do. Um, and the town, Chief Casanovas and town manager Jacobson were really, um, they were right on board about that too. So. Uh, Mr. Fahey and I met and reviewed the five-year capital plan as previously approved and made some changes to reflect the addition of air quality improvement projects to be completed in FY22. And the revised FY22 CIP document is included in your packet and it will require a vote of your approval. And if there's any questions on that, I'd be happy to answer it as well. We just felt that it was a good time to try to hit the air quality while we're working on it and to continue it on into FY22. So those were the changes, some of the changes we made. I would entertain that motion. I make a motion to approve the revised FY22 CIP as presented uh, by the business manager. Do I have a second? second I'll second that. Any discussion? Yes, I have a question. Yes, what, yeah. What's Thank wrong? You with the high school that we need new flooring, flooring upgrades. So well, through the, oh, Cecilia, I'm sorry, go ahead, Cecilia. That's fine. I just from, because it is getting to be an older building, we do from time to time replace the carpeting. Um, a lot of times I know Mr. Fahey now, instead of having full, like a full piece of carpet, we'll do the carpet squares. So those are some of the things that we're doing. and. Dr. Canfield, if you want to weigh in on some of that as well. Like yeah, I was just going to, you actually just hit the nail on the head. So it, when in the high school going on now 15 years, um, the main hallways, or I should say, yeah, the main hallways on each of the floors is carpeted. And after 15 years, those, those carpets are, they're old, they're wearing out, they're stained, they're stinky, um, and they just, they just need to be changed. Um, so the flooring in and of itself is fine. The classroom flooring is fine. It's really just ripping out that rug and replacing it. So it's, you know, it's sightly, it's clean and, you know, looks nice. That's all. Okay. I understand that, but I was thinking of the floor, the floor itself. And I'm like, what happened uh, to the floor? Yeah. Sorry. No, and I, happens, no, absolutely. no, no, no. In our world, when we say flooring, it's all encompassing. It can be carpet, tile, rug yeah. squares, painting the, the auditorium floor it can be a, anything plyboard on the on the stage so good question okay thank you good question mr Jordan is doing his due diligence to keep the building up to par he's been doing a very great job with that so that's part of his ongoing effort so any other questions no other questions 
Okay, roll call vote. Mrs. Harrington? Yes. Mrs. Holloway? Yes. Mrs. Kaufman? Yes. Dr. McCrillis? Yes. And Mr. Scobie, yes. It is a vote. Thank you. And then we'll also in your packet, I provided a year-to-date budget report dated December 22nd. Um, and along with that, I've also included a small listing of budget transfers to keep the budget updated. Um, and I'd be happy to answer any questions, and the budget transfers would need a vote of your approval. But if there's any questions on any of that, I'd be happy to answer it. I would entertain that motion. I make a motion to approve the transfers between the series as presented. Do I have a second? Second. Any discussion? Any questions for Cecilia? Roll call vote. Mrs. Harrington? Yes. Mrs. Holloway? Yes. Mrs. Kaufman? Yes. Dr. McCrillis? Yes. And Mr. Scobie, yes. It is a vote. Thank you. And that's the end of my report for tonight. And thank you very much. Thank you. It was spectacular. <laughs> Do we have anything else this evening? Mr. Chair, that would conclude the uh, the items for the evening. Um, thank you very much. Okay, wasn't sure if you had some YouTube videos or something you wanted to put up to to show off. <laughs> yeah, you never know. You never know. <laughs> As my skill set, you know, increases, you never know. So watch out. Excellent. <laughs> well, I to, you know, I just wanted to change it up and you know, give the give the viewers at home a little bit of a you know, kind of different feel. To the no, Zoom room. <laughs> I'm sure Mrs. Guitar appreciated. appreciated it. She, I'm sure she did too, and I'm sure she's, you know, really wanting to get her hands on that sandbox. Um, <laughs> yeah. Maybe next meeting, if we, you know, we'll do breakout rooms or something fun. We'll do a, jig, <laughs> we'll do a jigsaw meeting or something. <laughs> the possibilities like to, are endless. I'd like to apologize for joining you late. I had a new computer, and I needed help setting up Zoom again. Oh yeah, that's okay. No it problems. Took like half an hour to yeah, get my no daughter problem. to help me. <laughs> no problems. No worries. I, I wanted to wait for you, and Dr. Hanfield said, no, let's just. That is not <laughs> true. That is a, Mr. Hugo can attest that is not true. <laughs> I would entertain a motion to adjourn. <laughs> I'll make that motion. Do I'll I have a second? <coughs> um, happy New Year. Good to see everyone again. Same. Everyone stay healthy. Yeah, same here. Yeah, same. Good night. Great to see you all. Take care. See ya. Bye bye. Carrington. Bye bye. Yes. Ms. Holloway. Good night. Yes. Mrs. Kaufman. <laughs> yes. Dr. McCrillis. Yes. And Mr. Scobie. Yes. It is a vote. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.